Now that you have some foundation in virology, we're going to start going through the replication cycle. And that will take us to the halfway point in this course. And then we'll, uh, second half, we'll start talking about disease mechanisms and prevention. So today I want to start off the replication cycle. We're going to take each step of the cycle as a separate lecture. I'm going to start talking about today how viruses attach to cells and how they get in. And so this is all about finding the right cell, delivering the payload. And I want you to think about it in terms of this word that I introduced last time, which is metastability. So viruses have to be really stable, and they also have to be unstable at some time to release the genome. And today it's, we're going to explore exactly what that unstable means. How does the virus come apart? What are the triggers for that? Now, the, the whole issue here, of course, is that viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. They have to get inside of a cell to replicate, but they're too big to simply diffuse across the plasma membrane. So uh, that is, is the one issue we have to deal with. We have to figure out a way to get them across that. And of course, the other is this metastability issue. How do we make the virus come apart? And we'll explore both of these today. Now. Um, most of the interactions between viruses and cells are random. Viruses are always floating around in the air in, in fluids. They have no means of locomotion. They can't move in any way. They just move randomly. They're pushed around by all sorts of uh, motions that, that affect things, Brownian motions, diffusion, electrostatics. They can bind anything. So if a virus, a collection of viruses gets into your respiratory tract, they will bind anything that's there. They will simply randomly bump into everything. That's one of the reasons why one of the virus strategies is to make a lot of virus particles so that one of them will have a chance of getting into your cell. So they bump into a lot of things, but there is some specificity to finding the right cell. So there's a lot of bumping around going on with no specificity, bumping into cells, but they may not be the right cell unless it has a receptor. So viruses will bind to many kinds of cells as they, as they move throughout us. It will bump into them, then they will roll off and bump into another one. So there's lots of this randomness. But uh, eventually they will hit a receptor molecule on the cell, and that initiates infection. So there's, there's, no, there's no directed action on the part of the virus. It doesn't say, I need to find this receptor and bind to it at all. It's just randomly bumping around to, uh, against whatever cell or debris happens to be present. But eventually it will find a receptor-bearing cell, uh, attaches to it, uh, in some cases, there's more than one receptor type, as we'll see. And then after it binds to it, it can transfer the genome inside the cell. So we're going to look at these two steps separately. We're going to first look at the attachment step and talk a little bit about that and how it works. And of course, it's, it's artificial to separate attachment from entry because it's all a continuum. But we do that to make it easier uh, to study. Now, the whole field of cellular receptors for viruses basically didn't uh, exist until the 1980s. We now know that uh, all viruses have to bind to a receptor. There are a couple of exceptions. There's some very interesting viruses of yeast uh, that never get outside the yeast. Yes, oh, you're not waving to me, sorry. There's some very interesting viruses of yeast that never get outside the cell, so they don't have to worry about receptors. And plant viruses uh, don't get into cells by receptors either. They get in by either mechanical damage, so the farmer runs over a plant and it has, he has some virus on his wheels of his tractor, he breaks the plant and it gets in that way, or insects or nematodes or other organisms actually put the virus into the plants. But for animal viruses that we'll talk about today, uh, and we, we will invoke the need to use a receptor and sometimes a co-receptor, a second molecule is also needed. As of eight, 1985, only one virus receptor was known, and that's sialic acid, which of course is a carbohydrate to which uh, influenza virus attaches. But very shortly after that, many, many new virus receptors were identified, and today uh, we have receptors for most viruses known. Last year, and just to show you how this technology moves, last year a new coronavirus emerged in the Middle East called the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome MERS coronavirus. And within 
three months of its isolation, its receptor had been identified. We have powerful experimental ways to do this. We have monoclonal antibodies, we have molecular cloning, we have ways to put DNA into cells, and many other approaches as well. And here is a slide just showing a few uh, viral receptors that happen to be for the picornaviruses, <clears throat> the family of viruses, including poliovirus and rhinovirus. And you can see they are largely transmembrane proteins. There's one with a uh, GPI anchor right here. Uh, and they have extracellular domains, and of course these are what interact with the virus. And then they have uh, domains that fall into the cell as well. And there are all sorts of cell surface proteins that serve as receptors. Uh, there are immunoglobulin-like proteins, that is these have a protein fold that was originally found in antibody molecules. Uh, there are integrins and many others as well. Uh, this one is very interesting. This is the low-density lipoprotein receptor, a molecule that's involved in uptake of cholesterol. And that points out that all of these proteins that serve as virus receptors have a function in the cell. They do not exist for the virus. Okay, it may seem obvious, but some people feel that uh, they're presented on the cell for the purpose of the virus getting in, and that simply isn't the case. The viruses have evolved uh, to use them. Some viruses, some sometimes different viruses bind the same receptor. I guess there's only a, a limited number of cell surface molecules uh, on a cell, and so multiple viruses have uh, evolved to take advantage of that. So for example, adenovirus and Coxsackie virus have a common primary receptor. Coxsackie, by the way, is named after uh, this town in upstate New York, um, which is where an outbreak of disease occurred in the 40s. They thought it was polio and it turned out to be a new virus. So I snapped that picture uh, one day driving up the New Jersey Turnpike. Coxsackie, New York. Um, swine herpes virus, which is called pseudorabies virus, binds the same receptor as poliovirus, the exact same cell surface receptor. So there are a number of these interesting examples, and what's perhaps more interesting about them is that these viruses are very different. Uh, adenovirus binds by this fiber that sticks out from the fivefold axis, as we'll see in Coxsackie viruses bind on the surface, whereas herpes viruses, a glycoprotein actually interacts with the receptor, and for polio, it's just the surface of the particle. So, Apparently, the same receptor can serve in different ways to interact with the virus particle. In addition, viruses of the same family can bind different receptors. So for rhinoviruses, there are three different at least three different receptors. Uh, and for retroviruses, there are 16, at least 16 different receptors. Those are the ones that we know so far. So lots of variability here. Let's take a look at a couple of, yes? Um, just a quick question about your use of the uh, primary receptor. Does that mean that most viruses have a, I guess, a primary receptor, one that's more common? Okay, so the question is, what does it mean when I say a primary receptor? So this actually refers to the fact that some viruses need to bind two separate proteins on the cell surface in order to get in. This, and sometimes we can say one is the primary receptor because it's to which the virus first attaches, and then another receptor brings it into the cell, all right? So that's why it's called primary here. In other cases, it seems that both receptors engage the virus at the same time. Nevertheless, people will call them receptor and co-receptor, really just a matter of which one was discovered first. But the word primary implies that that's the first one engaged by the virus. Let's take a look at a couple of virus receptor interactions. First, let's take a virus that's built with icosahedral symmetry. It's a protein shell without an envelope. And there are two examples here, poliovirus at the top and rhinovirus at the bottom. And uh, the top is polio in uh, red, blue, and yellow. These are the three of the four viral proteins that make up the shell. And you should be able to see that there's a five-fold axis of symmetry right there because there are five copies of the blue protein around it. And this is a model of the virus. It's made by cryo-electron microscopy, showing the receptor bound to the particle. So the receptor was produced apart from the cell, was mixed with virus, and then the structure was solved. And you can see these are the receptors, these gray molecules here. And there are 60 of them on the particle, which is exactly what you would predict for icosahedral symmetry, because everything is repeated 60 times. 
and the receptor molecule binds around the five-fold axis of symmetry. This is actually a groove in the virus particle. It is illustrated in this diagram on the right. Here's the five-fold axis, here's the cell membrane, and a single receptor. It, see, it binds into this little depression. And when this was first seen in the structure of the virus, it was called the canyon, um, and that word has stuck. So the virus receptor binds in this canyon, and uh, you can see that that is a way of concentrating the virus on the cell surface. So even though this is a relatively smooth particle, it does have these corrugations, and apparently they serve for receptor interaction sites. And many, many viruses interact with the receptors like this. Another strategy is exemplified by rhinovirus at the lower left. These are the same family as polio, but of course cause a very different disease. And here the receptor is shown in gray also. This receptor happens to be low-density lipoprotein receptor. So again, it was produced in the absence of a cell membrane, uh, and it was added to the virus. It binds. Uh, also at the five-fold axis of symmetry, so here is one five-fold axis, but it's not binding in this canyon as, as for uh, polio, but rather at the very plateau. So here is a plateau. For some reason, the crystallographers use geographic words to describe these features, canyons and plateaus and ridges and all this. I don't quite get it, but I guess it serves to describe them. So the LDL receptor is binding on this flat area right at the five-fold axis of symmetry. So there isn't any groove or any sort of feature there. It, nevertheless, the proteins can interact. They can form non-covalent interactions. These are not covalent whatsoever because the virus has to be able to detach from it, of course, at some point. All right, so those are two examples of how uh, the receptor fits into two different icosahedral virus particles. A third example is adenovirus, which is a bigger DNA-containing virus with an icosahedral shell also, except it has these uh, fibers sticking out from each five-fold axis of symmetry, which you can see in the cartoon, and you can also see in this electron micrograph. Uh, the fiber is a trimer, and the very tip of that fiber, this knob feature, is what actually interacts with the cell receptor for adenovirus. And so this is an example where a, a structural feature makes perfect sense in terms of interacting with the receptor. Uh, and this on the upper left is a structure of the fiber bound to the primary receptor for this virus, which happens to be called uh, CAR. CAR stands for Coxsackie virus adenovirus receptor because, again, it's used by both viruses. So here is the fiber trimer, one, two, three subunits. It's just the very tip of the trimer and how it interacts with three uh, molecules of CAR. The molecules of CAR are shown in lighter blue. You can see their interactions along the side here. So uh, fiber binds to CAR to allow the virus to attach to cells. So this is different from polio and rhino where the receptor is interacting right on the surface of the capsid. Okay, so those are three examples of icosahedral viruses that bind and many, many other viruses that have that symmetry bind in a similar way. Let's look at some envelope viruses now. And the first one is uh, influenza virus, which is shown here. Uh, this is a virus with an envelope, which contains viral glycoproteins. And remember, the RNA genome is inside. It's a helical nucleocapsid. And there are a number of viral glycoproteins in the envelope. The one we're going to be concerned with right now is the one labeled HA or hemagglutinin. And this is the, vi the viral glycoprotein that attaches to the cell receptor. It's called hemagglutinin because it, it was originally found to bind red blood cells. And that's an assay that we can use to detect these particles, hemagglutination. But the virus doesn't actually infect red blood cells. Uh, the way the virus binds is it recognizes sialic acids at the ends of glycoproteins. And uh, we'll, we'll look at that in more detail in a moment. So you have a virus particle floating around, it bumps into a cell, and if that cell has sialic acids on it, the virus will bind uh, via the hemagglutinin molecule. And every cell in us has sialic acid, so potentially this virus could bind to a lot of cells, but it, as we'll see later, the only ones it replicates in are the cells of our respiratory tract. So the receptor for influenza virus, as I said, is a carbohydrate called sialic acid, and that's shown here. Sialic acid is a carbohydrate that is present at the end of carbohydrate chains which are on glycoproteins. So here in, in blue is the glycoprotein. It's a transmembrane glycoprotein. It's a cellular protein. 
and then it's, it's glycosylated at several sites and each of the circles is a carbohydrate uh, subunit. And the very last one is, is sialic. When sialic acid is present, it's always the last one. It's never in, in the interior in any of these sugar chains. And this is what sialic acid looks like, the typical six-membered carbon ring and a number of side chains. And here it's shown linked to galactose. So the receptor for influenza is this sugar right here, but it turns out that the way the sugar or the way the carbohydrate is linked to the second unit, in this case galactose, influences which viruses will bind. So human strains of influenza virus, the ones that infect us, preferentially uh, bind to uh, alpha-2,6 linked sialic acids. Uh, and one that's actually shown here is an alpha-2,3 linked, that is the one preferred by avian influenza virus strains. And this will become relevant later on when we talk about avian uh, influenza. So human strains like alpha-2,6, avian alpha-2,3, and you can see the linkage. Alpha-2,3 simply means the two are linked together by this, uh, with an oxygen in between, between the two and the three carbons of the two molecules. And alpha-2,6 would be a, a bond between this number two carbon and this number six carbon up here. So that simple difference allows uh, discrimination between viruses. So uh, human strains don't particularly like to bind to uh, alpha-2,3. This is the full name for sialic acid, N-acetyl uh, neuraminic acid. This is the N-acetyl group. Uh, and this is the receptor for influenza A and B viruses. There's a slightly different uh, neuraminic acid acetylated on a different position, which is the receptor for influenza C viruses. The way the sialic acid binds the hemagglutinin is very well known. We have the crystal structure of the HA bound to sialic acid. So here on the left is the HA molecule. It's a monomer of the HA, but what's on the virus is actually a trimer. And the, the, the protein, and here would be the virus membrane, has a very elongated stem with lots of alpha helical content. And then there is a globular head make up, made up of uh, anti-parallel beta strands. And it's in the head where the sialic acid binds. And here is a blow up of the head looking down from the top here now on the right. And you can see in green is a molecule of sialic acid which is bound in a pocket. So this pocket has evolved just to bind the sialic acid. It makes interactions with many of the side chains in the HA molecule. And you can alter these amino acids in the HA by mutation and show that in some cases you will get rid of sialic acid binding, sometimes you can improve it. You can also switch the, the specificity of a given HA. Let's say you take a human HA which likes to bind to alpha-2,6 linked sialic acid. You can make a few amino acid changes, I think you can make as little as one, and make it bind alpha-2,3 sialic acid. So it doesn't take very much in order to do that. So that's the uh, sialic acid binding site of the hemagglutinin. Another virus, yes? Uh, so you said that they normally exist as a trimer? The hemagglutinins exist as a trimer on the virus surface. So are they right? interacting with the same sialic acid? Or, uh, they probably are interacting with three different okay. sialic acid molecules because they're very small compared to the HA and they would fit in. Right. So let's take a look at another uh, enveloped virus with a glycoprotein that attaches to a receptor. And this is HIV-1, human immunodeficiency virus type 1. This is another one of our model organisms. And this is, a, this is actually a picture from an animation, which I think we'll see later. And here's an HIV virion uh, binding to a cell membrane, which is in uh, purple. And you can see, first of all, that this virus particle has glycoproteins on it. These are also trimers. In fact, this is a common theme. These viral glycoproteins that bind cell receptors on envelope viruses tend to be trimers as far as we can tell. Uh, all the ones we've studied so far. So uh, you can see they're trimers, um, but there are not very many of them, and that's one of the features of HIV compared to flu. Flu is packed with HA and NA molecules, and HIV, it's very sparse. And this is actually important because when antibodies bind these viruses, that's how they block their infectivity. We make antibodies against viruses, and they block infectivity. And the, the fact that HIV doesn't have very many glycoproteins on its surface is one of the reasons it's been very hard to make a vaccine uh, against it. Anyway, this uh, glycoprotein engages uh, 
actually two receptors on the cell surface. Uh, there, is a there is one receptor called CD4, uh, which is a protein expressed uh, on CD4 positive T cells, and that gives the virus tropism for those cells, and those are part of the immune system, of course, and destroys them, and that's why you have immunosuppression. It also needs a co-receptor to get into cells, and this is a chemokine receptor uh, which can be CCR5 or CXCR4, two different chemokines. And we'll see how those engage uh, in a moment. Okay, so let's review some of this on Socrative. So this first viral receptors of the cell surface, what's correct about uh, that? Which statement is correct? Number five has got any the most, that's correct. And a little bit on number two and the others. Okay, so let's see what we have here. Uh, number one, combined directly to icosahedral virus capsid proteins. That's correct. Remember I showed you how receptors bind to the polio and the rhinovirus capsid directly. Uh, interact with glycoproteins of envelope viruses. Sure, that's influenza virus and HIV. Uh, can be carbohydrates or proteins, right? So sialic acid is a carbohydrate. It's the flu receptor. And, and the others I've shown you are proteins. Have cellular functions? Absolutely. So the answer is all of the above. Okay. Now, we've, we've bound our viruses to cells. Let's talk about how they get inside and treat. Cells are very good at taking things in. They have to. They have to take in all sorts of nutrients and various signaling molecules and so forth. So they have many ways to do it. Uh, on the left is one kind of, of, of mechanism called phagocytosis where uh, certain kinds of cells like macrophages or other phagocytic cells will take up foreign particles for various reasons. Uh, they envelop them in the plasma membrane and take them in. This is usually reserved for big particles. Now, we didn't usually think that this is functioning in virus uptake, but, you know, because the particle size is one to two microns, but maybe those Pandora viruses that are one micron, maybe they're taken up by this mechanism. Nobody's studied it yet. So up until this year, I've said, you know, viruses are not taken up by phagocytosis, but maybe next year I'll have to change that. That's the way virology goes. Anyway, viruses are taken up by the processes shown on the right. And these are two distinct ways that cells take up materials. The first is pinocytosis which is a constitutive process where vesicles pinch off at the cell surface, they, they en encase materials, molecules that are in the extracellular fluids, and simply bring them in in vesicles. So this is also referred to as cellular drinking. That's always happening. It's a constitutive process, and if you look at a cell in real time, you will see this happening really, really quickly all the time. Uh, some viruses probably get in by this route, and we'll see an example of that today. The other more commonly known route is by the receptor-mediated endocytic pathway. And this is a pathway that the cell utilizes. A, it, it, the cell has receptors for various materials on the cell surface that it would like to bring in the cell. For example, low-density lipoprotein receptor is, is meant to bind LDLs and bring them in the cell. And it does so by this process of, of uh, binding, uh, internalization in a vesicle. Then the vesicle moves towards the interior of the cell. This process is actually stimulated by ligand binding in many cases. So uh, LDL will stimulate uptake of itself once it binds a receptor. It actually stimulates the whole process of 
of uh, ves vesicle formation and movement into the cell. And viruses appear to do that also. We're just learning that when viruses bind to their receptors, they also turn on endocytic pathways by various signaling uh, pathways that we're not going to really talk about. So now we got viruses on the surface. They're bound and they're being taken up. And an important point is that these vesicles containing the viruses don't simply move through the cytoplasm by diffusion. The cytoplasm is way too crowded. This is a very nice artist's rendition of the cytoplasm, starting from the plasma membrane here uh, with what look like trees, I guess, growing, but these are glycoproteins. And then you have um, the actin microfilaments right below the plasma membrane, and then lots of other microtubule-type structures here, ribosomes. And then you move towards the cell, so we're going here and move towards the nucleus. Here is some uh, endoplasmic reticulum. Here's a clathrin molecule moving in some more. Um, there's a nuclear pore here. Yeah, here's a nuclear pore. It's so big I can't recognize it. Uh, and then we get into the nucleus here where the DNA is all wrapped up in nucleosomes. That's what these little guys are, pretty neat. All right, so it, if I, there's no way a virus is gonna diffuse from the plasma membrane to the nucleus. We used to think that was what happened, but we didn't know very much. And here's a, th a thought experiment that addresses that. It's a theoretical experiment where uh, the viscosity of the cell has been calculated and then the, the transport time for viral components are estimated just by diffusion. So take poliovirus and the amount of time it would need to travel 10 microns, which would be from the plasma membrane to the nucleus roughly. It would take, in water, it would take three, four seconds, say. Uh, based on uh, the diffusion constant of the particle. And for herpes virus, which is bigger, it takes longer, 14 seconds. And for vaccinia, which is even bigger, it would take 35 seconds to move just from the surface of a cell to the nucleus, assuming it was water inside. But it's not water, it's cytoplasm, and it's very viscous. So they've, they've made this assumption that the cytoplasm would be 500 times more viscous. And now it takes a half hour for the virus, for polio, to get from the membrane to the nucleus, two hours for herpes and vaccinia uh, for uh, five hours. And this is simply not happening because these viruses are, polio is replicating before a uh, half hour is up. So movement has to occur via the transport machinery, essentially. It doesn't diffuse. There's, there's very little role, if any, for diffusion. The transport machinery, which of course consists of microtubules with motor proteins on them that run things up and down the cell, these are how uh, the viruses move around. And here's a slide that summarizes this and all the other ways that viruses get into cells. It's kind of a nice summary. So many viruses, as I've told you, are taken up by endocytic pathways. And as these have been studied, it turns out they're all different flavors. There's clathrin-dependent endocytosis, which was the originally discovered endocytic pathway. Uh, viruses bind to receptors on the cell surface. They're taken up into vesicles which are coated by clathrin. Uh, dynamin is a protein that pinches off the neck of the vesicle, moves into the cell, the clathrin goes away. And then this moves uh, towards the centrosome via microtubule transport motors. You can see them here. They're attached to the endosome and they move down. So they don't just diffuse. The, the endocytic pathway is normally uh, using this kind of microtubule system to move in, and viruses stimulate it when they bind to their receptors. There are also other kinds of endocytosis, clathrin and caviolin independent, for example. Caviolin dependent endocytosis, uh, this is not something I would expect you to, to remember. Just the fact that endocytic pathways are diverse and viruses have evolved to utilize all of them. And again, in most cases, uh, the movement is on these motor proteins. Now also shown on this slide are viruses that actually uh, enter at the cell surface. So here we have an envelope virus whose membrane is fusing right at the cell surface and then its nucleocapsid is right there. This happens to be uh, an RNA virus so it can start doing its job right here. It doesn't have to go anywhere else so it probably doesn't engage the microtubule system. Uh, here's an envelope dicosahedral virus that fuses at the uh, plasma membrane but this happens to be a DNA virus so it needs to get in the nucleus so it moves, it actually moves along on motor proteins. There's good evidence for adenovirus, for example, that it docks onto a motor protein and moves all the way to the nucleus and then uh, moves on to the nuclear pore. Okay, so we're gonna talk about a few of these, the mechanisms that are involved in this transport, but the important point is that you need to be actively moved around the cell, cellular pathways, 
are used for that. So, so there are a number of really nice animations available for virus entry, and this is one of them by this company, Ex Vivo, and this is a endosome being uh, motored along on a microtubule by a motor protein, which is walking, it looks like, right? It's a little bit of human, uh, humanization, I think, but that's, this is what's happening in the cell. Of course, I think it's much more crowded than even this shows. But basically, if there were a virus in here, the virus would be moving down uh, into the cell. And eventually, the virus would get out of it, uh, out, of the, out of the vesicle. OK. All right. Let's see what we have, have to show. Which of the following does not play a role in virus entry? which does not play a role. I misled, I misled you, apparently. I guess I haven't mentioned lysosomes, huh? All right, my bad. Um, so number, well, let's look at the question. This is good to keep me on the ball, too, right? All right, uh, so clathrin-mediated endocytosis plays a role. I did mention clathrin and endocytosis. Diffusion of viral and plasma membranes. Some of the viruses fusing at the plasma membrane. Diffusion, that doesn't play a role, and a lot of you got that. Uh, microtubule mediated transport does play a role. And then you, some of you saw lysosomes that he didn't mention lysosomes, so he chose that. And um, we're going to talk about lysosomes now, but of course, lysosomes fuse with endosomes as they move into the cell, and I meant to tell you that, so get that one back. Okay, let's talk about fusion at the cell surface. Here's an exam two examples of viruses where uh, they're enveloped and their membrane fuses with the plasma membrane. Okay, and that's just diagrammed up here. And that puts the nucleocapsid in the cytoplasm. Here's a, que here's a question of metastability. So this is a stable virus. How does it become unstable to uncoat? What controls that? Because this virus doesn't want to be uncoating everywhere. And the key is engaging in receptors. So that's shown below here. So let's, let's take a look at this mechanism. Uh, this particular virus has two glycoproteins in the envelope. They're called the F and the HN. And again, this is a viral membrane here. We've blown up this virus at the top, which happens to be a paramyxovirus like measles. It's got two glycoproteins, HN, hemagglutinin, and neuraminidase. So it's two, the two flu glycoproteins, the HA and the NA, combined into one. And then the F stands for fusion. So what happens is this, this fusion protein is the protein that's going to fuse the virus in the cell membrane, but it's kept in a retracted state, so the virus doesn't fuse everywhere. You see, uh, at the, uh, end, the end terminus of F1, this little thin area here is actually the fusion peptide. It's a short amino acid sequence that, if you put it next to a membrane, will, will go into the membrane and catalyze fusion. But it's, it's folded back in the virion, so the virion, when it bumps into random cells, doesn't fuse with them, because it doesn't want, it only wants to fuse, it doesn't want to do anything. It should only fuse with cells that have a receptor. So the virus binds the, uh, a receptor via this HN protein. So now the virus is bumping around and it hits one with a receptor, and, and HN engages it. Uh, and when, and that's shown here, the red is the receptor, uh, when the receptor engages HN, it transmits a conformational change to the fusion protein, it flips out this fusion domain, which can then stick in the membrane. Right? So the metastability is conferred by interacting with the receptor on the right cell. That then exposes the fusion peptide, which again is the sequence, uh, and it can insert into the membrane. Now, an important point here is that uh, this fusion peptide is part of a precursor. You can see the F protein uh, goes around, there's, there's the fusion, then there's another little part of 
of the F protein, which is not a fusion region at all. So this has to be cleaved away to expose the fusion peptide, and you can see generating an N-terminus here. And that's another uh, restriction. Uh, this cleavage typically hap can happen during entry or during productive infection of a cell. And it's another restriction to make sure that the F protein doesn't fuse just randomly, but only in cells with uh, the right protease. So receptor engagement controls the exposure of the fusion protein. Here's another example. This one is HIV. And this shows you why HIV needs two receptors to get in cells. So the HIV glycoprotein looks like this. It has a transmembrane fusion protein, very much like the paramyxovirus one, except the fusion peptide is, is already exposed. But it is wrapped around and pointed towards the viral membrane, so it's not going to fuse with anything. And then there's an attachment domain called SU. And what happens is the virus uh, will bind only to cells that have CD4 on them. Here's CD4 shown on the right. And the binding of, um, of, of the viral glycoprotein to CD4 transmits a conformational change to the viral glycoprotein itself. It can now engage the second receptor, which is called CCR in this case. Um, and that then allows the fusion peptide to wrap around. So two different conformational changes. Binding to the glycoprotein initiates a change in, in this uh, attachment glycoprotein <coughs> to be able to in interact with the second receptor. And then that is needed to fold out the fusion peptide here. So that's why you need two receptors. Just binding to CD4 is not enough. If you don't have CCR, the second receptor on the cell, uh, the fusion peptide will never engage the cell membrane. All right, so those are two different mechanisms. Now, here's an animation of HIV uh, coming to infect the cell. That's HIV in red. These are lymphocytes that uh, are expressing CD4. So the virus is going to bind. This is blood, blood cells. You can see the viruses are moving around. They bounce into everything until they find a cell that has CD4 and hopefully the second receptor. So these are the CD4 molecules here. And the virus is going to engage them. Very dramatic, right? <laughs> I think there's music. Yeah. And these are the viral glycoproteins. It's a trimer, remember? And the fusion peptide is up there next to the viral membrane. I don't know if you saw that, but it's, it's hidden. And this is the domain that's going to interact with CD4. All right, so it first interacts with CD4, and that transmits a conformational change, which you can't see here. And then it engages the second receptor, CX. CR5, CCR5 or CXCR4. And that, well, then the artist decided to take everything away <laughs> to make it clearer. That makes the fusion peptide fold out, which inserts uh, into the cell membrane and uh, allows the two membranes to fuse. Now, what makes the fusion actually occur? These, these fusion peptides do something called hairpinning. They begin to fold and they draw the two membranes together. The key to getting two membranes to fuse is to bring them so close together that you exclude water molecules. And that's what's done here. And then you see the viral membrane uh, fuses with that of the cell, and then the nucleocapsid uh, goes into the cytoplasm. All right, so the two receptor engagement are needed to flip out the fusion peptide. It sticks in the membrane. Then the viral glycoprotein hairpins, which essentially brings the two membranes together. Yes? <coughs> So this, this one here on the top where we have uh, HN, the question is, is this general or specific, this pathway? This, um, so this particular illustration is for paramyxoviruses, measles, mumps, and rubella. But there are also other viruses that follow this paradigm. That is, receptor engagement exposes the fusion peptide. It's actually the case for both of these examples. Receptor engagement is helping to expose the fusion peptide. Here you simply need a second receptor. Thank you, sir. Sure. Yes? Um, for a viral attachment and entry, is uh, interaction between one viral receptor and, say, part, one like, group of partner receptors on the cell membrane be sufficient? That's a good question. How many receptors do you need to engage to get on coding? And it's not really been studied with a lot of viruses. We know for polio that you just need a few. And I suspect that those, those engagements have to be around one five-fold axis of symmetry. For influenza, 
it appears that one or two might be enough also. So not too many. You don't need to coat the virus particle with receptors at all. Yeah. All right. Now let's look at, another, we looked at how HIV fuses at the cell membrane. So the trigger again, so what makes it metastable is the receptor interaction which allows the fusion peptide to pop out, all right? Let's look at another example where receptor engagement isn't enough to catalyze fusion. You need something that the cell provides in addition to a receptor. And that, in this case, for, which is influenza, is low pH. So it turns out that low pH catalyzes fusion for many enveloped viruses. So the endo, in the endocytic pathway, as the endosomes uh, form, as the, the, the membrane invaginates, you form a clathrin-coated vesicle. It moves into the cell. A natural or normal part of the endocytic pathway is that protons are pumped into the endosome interior. So there's a pump in the endosome membrane, an ATP-driven pump that brings protons in, and that drops the pH in the endosome as it moves towards the nucleus. All right, so it slowly drops more and more, and this is because the cell is trying to dissociate ligands from their receptors. But viruses have evolved to take advantage of this to, un to fuse their membrane with that of the host cell. So here's influenza virus, which is bound to a sialic acid-containing receptor. It's taken into the cell by endocytosis, and the pH is dropping. At the top is a, is a blow-up of just the HA molecule. So we have the HA bound to the receptor. Here are the globular heads that bind to the receptor and the, the alpha helical st stem. And look at this red sequence down here at the bottom. That is the fusion peptide. It's hidden at the base, so it can't fuse randomly with any membrane-containing material that the virus bumps into. As the endosome moves in the cell and the pH drops, the conformation of the HA molecule totally changes. About pH 5.5, it undergoes this amazing flip. And what happens is these red fusion peptides, which are at the tip of, of two uh, coiled coil structures right there, they flip up and they insert into the membrane. The globular heads splay away, the fusion peptides flip up, and that's mediated by uh, this, this yellow sequence here. Uh, it's, it's actually not correct in this picture. This yellow sequence becomes an extended alpha coiled coil. So it changes conformation and it shoves these fusion peptides into the cell membrane. Uh, and then they undergo this hair pinning, which means they bend and bring the two membranes together, and eventually they can fuse. All right, so here the, the fusion is catalyzed by low pH, which exposes the fusion peptide, much in the way that receptor engagement exposed the fusion peptide for the two examples I just gave you. Here it's low pH, uh, and that's influenza virus. And then the, the RNAs can get out, and eventually they will go in the nucleus. Now, I have a picture here of the structures of these HA molecules as they're undergoing this fusion. So here is um, a native pH, uh, sorry, this is the hemagglutinin at um, neutral pH. This is the sialic acid binding part up here. It's a trimer now, so it's the biologically active form. Uh, here's the alpha helical stem. Uh, and the fusion peptide is down here. You can't see it very well in this illustration. Uh, just like the paramyxovirus, fusion protein. This has to be cleaved also to be active. So this is an uncleaved HA. This is a cleaved HA which liberates the fusion peptide as a new end terminus. So protease is also important for the infectivity of these viruses. This is also at neutral pH. Here's a low pH form of the hemagglutinin. Uh, the globular head is, was not resolved in this crystal structure, so it's gone. Um, but now the fusion peptide is up here. So the fusion peptide was previously down here, here it was not alpha helical at all. At low pH, the whole molecule flips in conformation, and the fusion peptide is presented up here, and the whole uh, region becomes alpha helical. So that's the basis for that, that movement. So here's a picture that shows you the hair pinning a little better than in the previous one. So it's a series of steps which I've shown you, hemagglutinin binding to receptor, uh, the fusion peptide extended. So this is the low pH conformational change from here to here, from A to B. Fusion peptide hidden here is exposed here at low pH, inserts into the cell membrane, and uh, presumably several molecules are important with this, for this, as we've discussed. Uh, and then these molecules begin to hairpin. 
So the, f the flexible portions down here at the base, they begin to bend. We don't really know what causes that. Uh, but they, they begin to bend, and the effect is they bring the two membranes together. And as I said, once you bring two lipid bilayers close to one another, and if you can get the water out, and bringing them close together does that, uh, they will fuse, and you now make a pore through which uh, the viral RNA can flow. Okay, so that's the basis for that. Yeah? Are the insertion They're hydrophobic, yes. But is, is in the, the question is, are the insertion or the fusion peptides uh, transmembrane hydrophobic. They are hydrophobic, they're very short hydrophobic sequences, but they are not uh, transmembrane in the HA. The, in the HA molecule, they are just buried at the base, but they are not inserted into the membrane. Okay? And you can see that here. So here's the red fusion peptide. It's a ways up from the membrane. Um, yes? When you talk about the proton channel going into the, um, I'm assuming, why does that happen? The fact that the pH drops. So the question is, why um, is the pH dropping in the endosome, right? So the cell uh, uses endocytosis to bring in receptor-mediated ligands from the extracellular fluid. So uh, a, a ligand will bind a receptor, gets taken into the cell, and then to separate the ligand from the receptor, the pH is dropped. So that it's a normal part of the endocytic pathway to lower the pH as the endosomes move in the cell so that you can remove the ligand from the receptor and then put it into the cytoplasm. And those um, fusion proteins, are they different from the fusion proteins that are used to bring the virus particle into the cell? So these are the, the question is, are these different fusion proteins from the one brought in? Now these are the exact same uh, protein. The, he the hemagglutinin on the virus has the fusion protein buried near the viral membrane like this. Uh, and they are simply exposed when the pH drops. So the protein undergoes a massive conformational change. It goes from fusion protein down to fusion, fusion protein up. So it's the same exact protein. Okay. okay. Anything else? Okay. Where were we here? So hair pinning is, I showed you that. Okay. Let's see if I got you right, if I explained it properly this time. Viral fusion peptides are exposed for insertion into the host cell membrane when? Four is the major one, and a few of one, a few of all the others. So let's take a look at that. Virus particles near a cell, not really. Being near a cell isn't good enough. Remember, if then it would fuse with any cell, so that's not good. And the cytoplasm will then, it's too late by then. Uh, trimers uh, of the fusion peptides, not really. The, the protein exists as a trimer before it, uh, the fusion peptides are exposed. The endosome becomes acidified. That's the answer. The acidification exposes the fusion peptide, and docking on the nuclear pore uh, doesn't have anything to do with it. All right. Fusion, yes? So <clears throat> that answer is only specific for viruses that are uptaken via endocytosis, though, right? Because weren't we just talking about, like, RNA viruses that could fuse on the cell surface? Mm -hmm. Right. And those aren't, that's not pH dependent. Is it? Right. So the, the question is the, the previous question. Viral fusion peptides are exposed for insertion when? So it, it could be that at the surface, 
they're exposed without low pH, absolutely. Those are low pH independent fusion events at the plasma membrane. Those are dependent on receptor interaction. But that's not one of the, op the um, ans possible answers here. That's why this one is the right one. Yes, but that's the key difference. Sur cell surface fusion is not low pH mediated. It is simply mediated by interaction of receptors. Um, we put fusion proteins into three different classes. And class one is a type of fusion protein exemplified by the HA of influenza that we've been talking about. It's perpendicular to the membrane. It's mostly alpha helical. You can see that stalk is mainly alpha helical and it forms trimers. They all form trimers actually. Um, and then, as I said, uh, this is a diagram of the protein going from uh, uh, neutral pH to low pH with the fusion peptide exposed up here. Um, and of course, and then there's type 2 or class 2 fusion proteins, which are mostly beta sheets. Uh, these form dimers. Um, so that's, I wasn't correct in saying they're all trimers. And these are parallel to the membrane. Um, and you can see in this cryo-EM reconstruction of dengue virus how that works. Each of these colored units is a dimer of uh, the class 2 fusion protein. So these also flip up at low pH. The fusion peptide is FP in red over here. It's buried on the virus surface, so it doesn't fuse with anything. And then at low pH of the endosome, the whole proteins flip up as shown here. And the fusion peptide is at the top and it goes in the cell membrane, just like the flu HA, except it starts out uh, being parallel. Uh, this is a monomer, and this again is the dimer. And finally, we have a class three fusion protein. These are also perpendicular, a mixture of alpha helices and, and beta sheets. Uh, these are trimers found in rhabdoviruses and herpes viruses. Uh, and again, uh, the fusion peptides are buried. Here's a monomer. Here's where, where the protein would be attached to the membrane. You see the fusion peptide is way down, buried. Same theme all the time. Low pH form, the fusion peptide gets flipped up at the top. So all of these are, ca are similar in that the fusogenic form is catalyzed by low pH. So as you can see from this discussion, fusion has to be regulated. It can't occur in the wrong place because as I said at the beginning, the virus is bumping into all sorts of things. If it fused with every membrane it bumped into, that would not be productive. Uh, and I've told you that proteolytic cleavage activates uh, the fusion protein uh, and that's true for class one fusion proteins. Remember that uh, the cleavage has to be made to expose the N-terminus, which is basically the fusion protein. For class II fusion proteins, there's a second protein that sometimes covers them that has to be cleaved in order to allow fusion to occur. Uh, and in all of these cases, it's also low pH that's needed. So uh, there, are two, there are two checks that keep the virus stable, the cleavage of the fusion peptide and the low pH. Yes? Is low pH a requirement for all families of viruses? The ones that fuse at the surface don't need, the question is, is low pH required for fusion of all envelope viruses? The ones that fuse at the surface don't require low pH. And there's some evidence that some viruses may get in uh, through the endocytic pathway even without uh, the low pH being necessary for fusion. We'll talk about some of those uh, later on. Yes? Do the viruses that bind at the surface, do um their fusion proteins, um, are they of these three classes, even though they don't require low pHs? Or is that a separate class altogether? They are of these three classes. So the question was, the, virus, the viruses that fuse at the plasma membrane, are the fusion proteins a different class or one of these? And they're one of these, one, two, three. Yeah. This is, a, this is what, what it, what's out there as far as we know, but who knows what's happening tomorrow. Yes? So the, if once a cell is infected, is there feedback? What was? Like, does the virus, are there some viruses which upregulate, like, the receptor? OK. The Do the, can the virus upregulate uh, the receptor? So I don't know of any example of that where the receptor number is upregulated and it has any consequence. So one, th one example I can think of, rhinovirus infection of the respiratory epithelium. The receptor for some rhinoviruses is a molecule called ICAM-1. And ICAM-1 is then upregulated as part of the, of the inflammatory process that happens hours after infection. Uh, 
but I don't think that has any impact on virus infection because it's already too late. So I, I don't, and I don't know of any other examples, but there's certainly signaling going on through the receptor which is facilitating its uptake. So it's basically down-regulating the receptor with the virus attached to it. Yes? Do the receptors get recycled back to the yeah, membrane? Yes, so most of, most of the receptors brought in by the endocytic pathways are re recycled back out, and the same would be true for virus receptors. After the payload is put into the cytoplasm, they, they can go back out, right? Now, one, one last thing I want to tell you about influenza virus entry. We talked about how the endosome acidifies via this proton pump. It turns out that the M2 ion channel of the virus, remember there's a third protein in the virus particle. There are not many of them. You can see it here, this little green protein. It is a channel. And that channel lets protons into the interior of the virus particle. So as the endosome is acidifying, those pro some of those protons pass through the M2 and go into the interior of the virion. And this is thought to be needed to dissociate the ribonucleoprotein from the shell of the capsid, all right? And that allows the RNPs to come out into the cytoplasm when the membrane of the virus and the cell fuse. So if you inhibit this channel, there are drugs that bind to it. There are actually antiviral drugs that bind in the channel. Uh, those viruses get taken up into the cell, but the RNPs get stuck on the uh, endosome face and they never get uh, let go. So low pH is needed to dissociate those. All right, so I think uh, you, might, yeah, you might see that here. This is influenza virus binding a cell surface. It's being taken up by uh, endocytosis, a nice clathrin coated vesicle there. All right, we don't need to see a rolling vesicle. Now it's on a, a microtubule, which is good, moving along very quickly this time. And the clathrin's coming off, which happens. pH is dropping inside, and the HAs are starting to uh, alter their conformation, and then uh, the virus has, the envelope has fused, and the RNPs came out. Those are the yellow uh, RNA and protein, and they're going into the nuclear pore. This is the nucleus now. So that release of the RNP from the, sh there's a shell of protein underneath the envelope of the virus called the M protein, M1 protein, and the RNPs bind to that, and if the pH isn't lowered, they will never get out. Uh, here is a class two fusion protein. This is dengue virus, which is taken up also by endocytosis into an endosome. It's moving along a microtubule. The pH is dropping. Remember, these are uh, fusion proteins that are parallel. The, as the pH drops, they're gonna flip up, and the fusion peptide is now exposed for insertion into the uh, membrane. Of course, not all fusion peptides are going to engage because only the ones near the receptor uh, binding site. Uh, the fusion proteins are sticking in the membrane. You okay, see the, the, the glycoproteins have flipped up, and now they're hairpinning to draw the two membranes uh, together. This looks very insectoid, I think, don't you think? <laughs> And then the two membranes brought close together and they will fuse and then the viral uh, genome will come out, which happens right now. It's starting to come out there. And this is a plus-stranded RNA genome. It's just going to go in the cytoplasm and um, get translated. And these are some residual, this, this is what's left of the virus, right? The glycoproteins are left on the surface of the uh, endosome. All right. So. Any questions? Um, there, there was a, there's phyloviruses, of course, Ebola virus are these interesting filamentous viruses, and these enter the cell in an unusual way. Uh, the glycoprotein is shown here studying the filamentous particle. Uh, these, vi these viruses seem to be taken up by uh, pinocytosis, macropinocytosis, and a specific receptor hasn't yet been identified, so it may be that they are simply taken up uh, non-specifically, although I doubt it, there probably is a receptor we haven't identified. It moves into the endocytic pathway, so the macropinosomes fuse with endosomes and move into the cell. And um, in these endosomes, there are cysteine proteases called cathepsins. And these cleave the cap of the glycoprotein off. So the viral glycoprotein is shown up here with a mucin and glycan cap shown in pink. And as it gets into the endosome, the cap is cut off. 
And that exposes a binding site on the glycoprotein for a endosomal protein. This is a multiple transmembrane protein called NPC1. Uh, so the glycoprotein cleavage allows the viral glycoprotein to engage NPC1. And that somehow triggers fusion of the viral membrane uh, with that of the endosome. And that lets the RNA get out into the cytoplasm. So here, there's a second receptor in the endosome. It only, the virus only engages it until it's well into the endocytic process. So this is quite uh, unique. Now, the engagement of NPC1 is absolutely needed to get fusion. Whether low pH is part of this or not is not clear. NPC1 is Neiman pick type 1, uh, Neiman pick protein type C1. And, and this is a protein that is involved in cholesterol transport. You can see it looks like a transporter molecule. It's extremely important for our cholesterol balance. And there are people born without this gene or with mutations in it who can't uh, modulate their cholesterol levels, and they die by the time they're 10 or 12 years old. Um, if you take fibroblasts from those patients, which lack the protein, they cannot be infected with Ebola virus, because this protein is essential for uh, virus uptake. So it's a really unique and brand new uh, way of virus getting in with this second receptor. How universal remains to be seen. Uh, but these are very dangerous viruses to work with, so it's not easy to get the answers. All right. All right, why is filovirus entry unique? Number three is the answer, and one in four got some hits. Why is filovirus entry unique? Number three, because the particle binds a second receptor within the endosome. It's this NPC1 uh, molecule. It doesn't bind NPC1 on the surface. It does uh, enter the cell by endocytosis, but that's not what makes it unique. Many viruses do that. Uh, the glycoprotein must be removed before entry occurs. It's not removed, just the cap is removed. And movement requires motor proteins, of course, uh, any virus that's getting in the cytoplasm will require that, so it's not unique. I, I want to give you a couple of uh, examples of how an icosahedral virus can release its nucleic acid. We've talked only about envelope viruses fusing with membranes, but here is adenovirus, which has a protein shell, very stable. It can't fuse with a membrane because it's, it's not a membrane itself. How does it work? Well, the virus binds uh, its receptor. It's taken up into the endocytic pathway. Uh, which and these vesicles move along microtubules. Here's a beautiful electron micrograph of, a, of an adenovirus moving along the microtubule. Uh, I jumped ahead of myself. This is after it gets out of the endosome. Uh, as the endosome acidifies, uh, the viral capsid begins to undergo conformational changes. And it starts to break up uh, as proteases digest it. And one of the viral proteins, which is normally hidden, this yellow protein here, comes out of the particle, and this is actually a pore-forming molecule. It pops open the endosome, and that's what we're showing here. So that yellow protein makes holes in the endosome. The partially disassembled virus gets out. It latches onto microtubules and takes a ride to the nucleus, and that's what's shown in this electron micrograph, an adenovirus out of the endosome riding along a microtubule. Eventually, it docks on the nuclear pore. Uh, which you can see in this electron micrograph. It's been partially uncoated in the antisome, and so it releases its DNA. Yes? Um, because I know this, this isn't about anthropomorphized, not preventative. <laughs> Does it, um, when it's like all roads lead to Rome sort of thing, by writing these filaments, they're just going to end up near the nucleus, and when they, so in the previous virus, when they release mm -hmm. near the nucleus, it just goes through the nuclear pores by 
Well, that's a good, the question is how, to, once the viruses take a ride down these microtubules, how do they get to the nuclear pore from the microtubules? It's a good question. We don't really know. The last step, people have just figured out that the viruses do take a ride on the microtubules. Uh, how they uh, get to the nuclear pores is really not understood. Now, the other, the RNA viruses that move along, the endosomes containing RNA viruses that move along microtubules, uh, they're moving because the endosome is moving in, and that's part of the acidification process. As the endosomes move deeper into the cytoplasm, they're acidifying. So those, not all RNA viruses want to get in the nucleus. Flu is an exception. Most of them, the RNA comes out uh, beforehand, and it just gets uh, worked on in the cytoplasm. Yeah? How does the fourth form get out of the, the capsid? In the first place? And how does the capsid start breaking? So there are proteases in the endosome. Um, so at a certain point in the life of an endosome, it fuses with a lysosome, and that delivers proteases. And that begins to digest the capsid. And that, together with the low pH, uh, brings out that protein, that yellow protein that then disrupts the endosome membrane. All right, so that's one example. Polio virus is another example of a icosahedral particle where we have to get the RNA out. And here, the key is the receptor. The virus binds the receptor, and the receptor totally changes the makeup of the particle. It actually changes it so it now has a pore in it through which the RNA comes out. So here in dark purple is the native virus. As soon as it binds a receptor, uh, the, the conformation of the particle changes. It starts to get taken up into the cell, but very near the cell surface the RNA comes out. It doesn't have to penetrate into the cell at all. There's no low pH needed. So the receptor is all you need to uh, cause this transformation. And what happens is the virus, which is shown in uh, side view here, here's one five-fold axis of symmetry. Uh, it, we're showing it binding two receptor molecules here. The idea is that when the receptors bind the virus, it opens up this pore uh, in the middle, and two fusion, basically fusion peptides uh, are hidden normally in the interior of the virus. Those are these blue segments. Uh, they come out through uh, the capsid, uh, w through openings formed by the engagement of the receptor, and they make a channel in the membrane. So I call them fusion peptides, but they're not really because they're not fusing membranes. They're simply making, they're embedding into the membrane and making a channel, and then the viral RNA can come out through that. So if you just take purified polio and add receptor to it, the RNA will pop out because the receptor alone can do all of this. Now, the um, virus here, as it exists without the receptor, has a molecule of lipid bound to it. That's that gray molecule right there. And that has to leave for all this to happen. When the, when the viral receptor binds, it pushes out this lipid, and now there's room to move in the capsid. There are antiviral drugs that replace the lipid, and they fit in really tightly and they're shown here. Here is that little pocket where the lipid fits in uh, in the canyon. And there are antiviral drugs that replace the lipid and, bound, and bind very tightly, and they do not allow uncoating because they lock the capsid in a stable conformation. All right, so we, these antiviral drugs aren't very useful, uh, but they have elucidated the mechanism of entry. Here's a structure of polio with these antiviral drugs bind bound, you can see there's five around each five-fold axis, there would be 60 in the whole particle, and they're replacing the lipid. And again, if this were lipid and the receptor sits down on top here, it would pop the lipid out and allow the virus to uncoat. But it can't happen in the presence of uh, the, of the uh, antiviral compound. I want to tell you one example of why two receptors are needed for uh, virus entry, and that is for Coxsackie virus, which binds the CAR receptor, Coxsackie virus, uh, adenovirus receptor, and a second receptor called DAF. Um, CAR is a component of tight junctions, and DAF is on the cell surface. So Coxsackie virus needs to get to CAR, but it can't on an epithelial barrier because it's not accessible. So what, hap what turns out that happens is binding to DAF on the cell surface loosens up the junction so that the virus can move to CAR, and that's shown here. So here we have an epithelial cell with DAF on it. Coxsackie virus binds to DAF. That initiates a signaling pathway through a whole lot of kinases, 
which loosens up basically the cytoskeleton and opens up the junctions, which is where a uh, car is located. And the virus can move over and move into the junction, and it gets endocytosed and infects the cell. So this is why, in this case, two receptors are needed. The real one the virus wants is in the junction and inaccessible. So the virus has evolved to bind to a cell surface program, protein that turns on a signaling pathway to loosen up uh, the junctions. And I think this is our, our last example of virus entry. Um, this is real virus. These are viruses with two icosahedral shells, all right? There's an outer shell and an inner shell. Here's the outer shell, there's the inner shell. These are taken up by endocytosis. And these viruses, as the lysosome fuses with the endosome and all those proteolytic enzymes get in, they digest away the outer shell. And so here, uh, the, the outer shell is progressively being digested until we only have the inner shell or the core left. And this is very hydrophobic, and it simply penetrates uh, through the endosome membrane. All right, so here's an example of a virus that's utilizing the proteases in the endosome to remove the outer shell. The inner shell is really hydrophobic and can pop through the endosome membrane. So this explains why this virus has an outer shell, to hide the hydrophobic inner shell. So that's what regulates the, the stability of this particle. It's really stable as a two-shelled uh, particle, but as soon as you take that off, that outer shell with cellular proteases, then the virus can uh, pop into the cytoplasm. And our last question. How do non-enveloped icosahedral virus particles release their genomes? I have a feeling this one is going to be also mixed. Yeah, it's very mixed. Hey, I forgot to tell you another thing. <laughs> Let me go back here. I had to tell you that the RNA never gets out of this particle. <laughs> I forgot to tell you. So the core gets in the cytoplasm, and actually all the mRNA synthesis get, happens in this core. We'll talk about that in more detail last year, last time, next time. So for some viruses, the Nucleic acid never gets out, so you can have a pore, it can dock on the nuclear pore, the genome may never be released, uh, receptor-mediated conformational changes, it's poliovirus, so it's all of the above. All right, next, next time I have to remember to tell you. So this is a nice summary of everything we have talked about. We have talked about entry at the cell surface, entry by endocytosis, the motoring of viruses through the cytoplasm uh, by um, docking onto the microtubules and eventually getting in the nucleus. I think I have one more. This is the last one. Once these particles dock on the nucleus, I've told you about how uh, adenovirus puts its DNA in the nucleus. Herpes virus does the same thing. Influenza virus, the RNPs are small enough to get through the nuclear pore, but these two capsids are too big. Uh, the parvovirus capsids are small enough to fit through the nuclear pore, so they can actually get right into the nuclear plasm and uh, release their DNA.